Well, once again, welcome to another Open Air Preaching Hermeneutics. Heath Putzel from Fisherman's Call. Great to have you here on a Wednesday night. And uh, just like last week, uh, thank you very much for the comments. Uh, for those of you that are listening in as well, uh, we've had some great comments on uh, the Open Air Preaching Hermeneutics so far. And we are going to take some time over the next uh, roughly nine, ten weeks um, and walk through hermeneutics as it as it relates to handling a text, principles and tools uh, to help you improve in your preaching, especially in your ministries or in the open air. So tonight we're going to take a look at staying on the line. And with staying on the line, this is more of a conviction uh, than it is a tool or a principle. Uh, so when we look at staying on the line, I am fully convinced, and you might have heard it in the promo video, that the reason that we do not see potentially the power move in our preaching has to do with this conviction of staying on the line. And we're going to dive more into this as we go through this evening. So one of the things that uh, most of you know is I have been kind of an evangelist of sorts, not only for the gospel, but also for Charles Simeon Trust. And a lot of these tools and principles are based off of the Charles Simeon Trust. And that name, Charles Simeon, uh, Bill mentioned last week, and again, for those that uh, weren't here last week, you can watch the video, but Bill talked about Charles Simeon, okay? And I, I believe one of the greatest expositors of the 19th century truly was Charles Simeon. He was an English preacher, and he believed in a simple and clear explication of the Bible is what makes the church healthy and what makes the church happy. His works, um, which are known as Orhe Homiliticae, uh, or Sermon Hours, and if you have Bible software or you've looked online for Sermon Hours by Charles Simeon, well, you'll certainly find it. Um, if not, um, let me go ahead and just put this in the chat real quick. Uh, StudyLight, uh, StudyLight.org has a public domain uh, for sermon hours. And these are skeletons that Charles Simeon put together, skeletons of sermons throughout passages of the Bible. And what these skeletons do is they model the natural manner in which he believes the text should be treated. So you can get a glimpse into Charles Simeon and how he set up the natural way that a text should be handled. And Charles Simeon believed that Bible exposition does the heavy lifting of building up of the church. And I think that that holds true, especially in the open air and in our ministries as well. Expositional preaching does the heavy lifting for us. We don't need to worry about lifting heavily. We just need to find the, the, the gold mine that is sitting inside the text itself. And this belief never left Charles Simeon. You want to talk about longevity, 54 years in a single pulpit in a university town. He tirelessly gave himself to the primacy of preaching, week by week, year by year, decade by decade. He stood in the pulpit and he declared the word of God with clarity, with simplicity, and with power. And he defined his conviction about expositional preaching this way. My endeavor is to bring out the scripture what is there and not to trust what I think is in there. I have a great jealousy on this heed, never to speak more or less than I believe to be the mind of the spirit in the passage that I'm expounding. So Charles Simeon viewed the preacher as duty bound to the text. He was committed to staying on the line, never rising above the text to say more than what the text meant to say, and never falling below the line and lessening the text in its fullness and in its focus. And that's why I say this is more of a conviction. If you're not convinced and you're not convicted, first of all, to expositional preaching, and second of all, to staying on the line, you're in danger, per se, of running roughshod over Scripture. God has declared in his word exactly what he intended to say in every passage of Scripture. And it's our goal to harness what he declared and to represent that to the audiences and the ministries that we're in. 
So as we take a look this evening, I want us to go back into Scripture and see what it talks about staying on the line. So if I can have three people go ahead and uh, take a look at these passages, I'm going to put them in the chat here. And the first person that gets a hold of it, um, or actually here, let me assign them. Um, if we can, Dan, can you do me a favor and take a look at Numbers 22:23? Yeah. And let's see, um, Mark, if you can do me a favor, Numbers 23, verses 12 and 26. And then, Bill, if you can do me a favor, Numbers 24, verses 12 and 13. And I put those in the chat, so uh, Dan, Mark, and uh, Bill, if you have those, go ahead and read them out for us once you get them. Numbers 22, verse 23. <clears throat> and they asked Saul, the angel of the Lord, standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. And the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field, and Balaam smote the ass to her, to turn her into the way. Uh, that was 22.35? Oh, 35, sorry. Numbers 22.35. And the angel of the Lord spake, the angel of the Lord said unto Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word that I shall speak unto thee, that thou shalt speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balaam. All right. And uh, Mark, when you have uh, 23, 12, and 26. And if you want to unmute your mic there, or here, let me go ahead and see if I can unmute it. Sorry about that. That's okay. All right. Okay, let's see. 23, 12, and 26. Correct. All right, 12, he answered, Must not I speak what the Lord puts in my mouth? And then, to 20, and then skipping down to 26, Balaam answered, Didn't I tell you I must do whatever the Lord says? I think I see where you're going with this one, but I'll, I'll wait. All right, and then Bill, Numbers 24, uh, verses 12 and 13. And Balaam said unto Balak, Spake I not also to thy messengers which thou sent me unto me, saying, Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold. I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord, either good or bad in my own mind, but what the Lord says, that will I speak. So are you getting a theme? Yeah. Here is Balaam as a model preacher. <clears throat> speak mm. only the word that I tell you. I can only speak what the Lord has me speak. And now I have to ask you, does that represent our preaching? Hopefully. To speak only as the Lord has told us to speak. Now I'm not talking about a prophetic word here. What I'm saying is, are we declaring in the word what God has declared in the word? hope so. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> If I'm, I if I'm not so. following that precept, I'm William Ellery Channing. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the line of Scripture. The line of Scripture is what the Lord speaks. I will speak all that he has us to speak. <laughs> Am I proof texting in the chat? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually I'm not. <laughs> Because if you, if you follow the whole narrative, you'll find out that uh, Balaam was only allowed to speak what the Lord gave him the words to speak. He couldn't do anything else. And that should be our mantra as well. Uh, what the Lord speaks is the line of Scripture, and all that the Lord speaks, I will speak. And as we know in God's Word, he's made it clear that his spokesmen, his prophets, were to declare what he said, nothing more and nothing less. And now I'm not, I'm not proclaiming that we're modern day prophets in a sense of the Old Testament prophets, but as we are spokesmen for God, as we are heralds and evangelists for God, we need to do the same thing. We need to speak only when God has spoken. We need to preach only what God has declared us to preach, nothing more than nothing less. And 
to kind of take a look at some of the seriousness of God's Word. Uh, Joshua, if you can do me a favor, um, and if you can take Deuteronomy 4.2, um, and no, I'm not proof texting this one either, uh, but <laughs> Deuteronomy 4.2, and Jeff, welcome. And Jeff, if you can do me a favor, if, you are, uh, if you're in the chat, I'm going to put it in here as well. If you can take Revelation 22, 18, and 19 for me. Can you hear me, Keith? Yep, I can. Good deal. So Joshua, when you have Deuteronomy 4, 2. Okay. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. All right. And then Jeff, Revelation 22, 18, and 19. Stand by. Oops. I gotta improvise, brothers. I'm in my shop to oh, okay. stay away from the noisy from the noisy family. I didn't bring my Bible in here, so I've got I got it right here though. Eighteen and nineteen, right? Yes. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which is described, which are described in this book. Mm. Brothers, these are the warnings when it comes to Scripture. We have them from the Old Testament. We have it from the New Testament. Do not add or take away from the words which I have commanded you to speak, or do not add or take away from the prophecy in this book. We've used Revelation 22, 18, and 19 quite often with uh, you know, some of the other cults like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and some of these others. But again, I, I have to ask, are, are we adding the scripture or are we taken away from scripture by possibly not staying on the line of scripture? Um, and that's just a question to throw out there as we take a look at uh, preaching God's word. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look a little bit further. And tonight we're talking about staying on the line. And the principle and the conviction that we're looking at tonight is we must stay on the line of Scripture, never straying above it or never falling below the line of Scripture. And along these lines, there, there's a wonderful illustration, and uh, here, here's the illustration for staying on the line. There it is. Nice. <laughs> So we must, we must stay in the line, never swing above it or below it. And, and that is our task that's at hand. Now, let's talk about, as Charles Simeon said, never going above the line or never going below the line. And when we take a look at above the line, what we're saying is, we don't want to add to or overstate in Scripture what's not really there. So when we talk about going above the line, we don't want to add to or we don't want to overstate in Scripture what's not really there. That means to say more than what God has said in his word. So we don't want to say more than what God has already declared in his word for us to say. Now, here's a question for you. And feel free to unmute yourselves. Uh, for a couple of you, I, I just for the lack of noise, I did mute, but I, you should be able to unmute it as well. What's the danger of going above the line? So as you think about it, feel free to unmute or even put in the chat. What's the danger of adding to or overstating in Scripture What's not really there? Well, you potentially add to God's promises, potentially. Okay. So you add to God prom God's promises. Mark? 
I was going to say, if you if you if you uh, if you overstate, that's a major hermeneutical violation. And again, you're reading something that's not you're trying to you're going from exegesis to eisegesis, as we would say. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Heath, I was going to say, I come from an Irish background. Uh, you could almost fabricate. Yeah. Uh, 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 and and that's what turned me to Reformed theology. Uh, when I, I was saved in a charismatic church, and I found all the, what the guys did was got up there and tell stories. Mm -hmm. And we as a Catholic family, we, every first Friday we get together and man, we could tell stories, and each year, each year they got better. You, you, sure. you know? <laughs> and so that's what pulled me back because it's like um, the word does something to you that no other preacher you don't even know what you're sending out. Right. Right. Anyone else? What are some dangers as well to overstating? what the Bible has said there. Legalism. Yeah. Yeah. You, you're you're going to fall out of exegesis for sure. You're going to start dropping into eisegesis. Uh, you're going to start fabricating what's not there. Um, and you fall into legalism. Or perfectionism. Uh, thinking that there's a standard there that you're able to keep. Or prosperity. God only wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and wise, and that's it. And legalism, adding those rules and regulations, uh, prosperity itself, taking all of the blessings of God's people, even in eternity, and applying them to us today. Or the risk of perfectionism. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in addition to that, Jeff, uh, talking about Mormons, Catholics, Jehovah's Witnesses, um, have a tendency to add additional traditions, rules and regulations above what Scripture says, speaking more than what Scripture is meant to say. Heath, if I may interrupt, can you give me a working definition of perfectionism? I think I know what it is, but I, want, I just want to be sure. Yeah, perfectionism um, is that, that working definition of you can be perfect in your own right. So you can okay. achieve the standard of sinless perfectionist or because you're saved, you no longer sin, period. Okay, got it. So yeah, you can be perfect in and of your own right. And then the flip side. So we're going to talk about above the line and now we're going to talk about below the line and then we're going to talk about staying on the line and we're going to take a look at some examples. So now we have falling below the line. And falling below the line is subtracting from the word or to not be truthful and faithful to what God is saying in his word. Yeah. Joe is, uh, Joe is putting in there uh, in the chat, could lead to your own damnation. Galatians 1.9. Um, if anyone says anything other than what I have declared, um, he shall be an anathema or accursed. A gospel, anyway. Yeah, they, uh, sorry, I was kind of that a little bit. Gospel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if anyone has preached another gospel, um, except what I've declared to you, let him be accursed. Um, also, uh, easy believism. Uh, yeah. And, and I think easy believism may fall a little bit more on below the line. Uh, subtracting from the word not to be truthful or faithful to what God has said in his word. Um, and maybe you're ahead of me on that one. Um, what are the dangers of falling below the line or subtracting from the word of God and not being truthful? Uh, so again, feel free to unmute or uh, type it in the chat as well. Well, I would say that the opposite of, of you know, legalism would be liberal. Anything that's really liberal, liberal theology, comes from a liberal reading of scripture, reading what's okay. uh, reading into it. Sure. Yeah, reading into it is adding to it. So when we're talking about below the line, we're talking about withholding information. Right. 
right, Bill? You, under, you undermine the sufficiency, and in, for instance, of the atonement. Yeah. Yeah. So here are some of the dangers, and, and you've all said them. Um, rounding off the sharp edges. So when we're not saying what God has said in his word at times, we may try to soften some things. Uh, that, that modern theological liberalism. Uh, God's not a God of wrath. He's a God of love. You say less, or you promise less. Or anti-supernatural. As Bill said, you may, you may downplay the atonement. You may deny the Holy Spirit. You may deny sin. It's not that big a deal. Uh, the miracles just become myths. Hell becomes an overstated metaphor. Hell's not real. It was just kind of a, a, a garbage dump outside in Gehenna. It's not a real thing. Judgment is less severe. We downplay judgment. Jesus, he wasn't the son of man. He wasn't God. He's just a good teacher. So is yeah. it necessarily withholding information, is it? What's that, Which Dan? It, could be, it isn't just about withholding information. It could be explaining away the, the clear teaching of Scripture, too. Right. Right. It, it's, not, it's, it's subtracting from the Word by not being truthful and faithful to what God says. We might even downplay the holiness of God by not declaring that he is holy the way Isaiah 6 or the way as, as Revelation declares it to be. You undermine the inspiration of Scripture and you undermine the, uh, the, the authority of Scripture. I mean, once uh, Joshua said liberalism, that, you see how they open up the whole door to nothing being true. Right. And uh, Brian McLaren and all his friends. Right, right. Yeah, you start to see the dangers of falling below the line and not staying to what God has declared in his word. So we've talked about above the line. What are some dangers above the line? Legalism, prosperity, perfectionism. Below the line, if we fall below the line, we, we dull those sharp edges. We round them off. Uh, God declaring in his tone, declaring in his his word exactly who he is, and we kind of soften it a little bit to make God, to make Christ, to make the Holy Spirit, uh, some of the theological terms a little bit more palatable uh, rather than the, the pointedness uh, sometimes that Scripture declares God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit as to who they truly are. Um, and that all stems from uh, that theological liberalism. You start to explain things away, then you lose the sufficiency and the inerrancy of Scripture. Obedience isn't required. Holiness yes. isn't required. Yep. So where are we at now then? Since we're talking about staying on the line, we are right on the line. And what does it mean to stay on the line? This is the careful task of every Christian preacher. If we are open-air preachers, we are declaring Christ. If we are declaring Christ, we are Christian preachers. And we must have the careful task and the conviction to stay on the line. You know, you're, you're in a courtroom and you often have uh, people come up to testify and they put their hand on the Bible and they say, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And that's what we're to declare as Christian preachers. The truth about God the truth about his word, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So, staying on the line, God's word, it is sufficient, it is fixed. It is fixed. God has declared in his word exactly what he has said. His word says something, and his word means something. You've often heard... He says what he means, and he means what he says. Um, and that's the same thing about God as he's declared in his word. His word means something. And his word says something, and it is fixed. 
So because we know that the Bible itself is inspired to distort or dilute its message in one particular text will inevitably distort or dilute the meaning of other passages. And there we start to go down that path of liberalism and start to erode the efficiency, or not the efficiency, the sufficiency anyway, and the inerrancy uh, of the Word of God. So staying on the line means that we are bound to the content and the intent of God's Word. We're bound to what He says in His Word. That's the content. And we are bound by the intent of His Word. What God is looking to get done. What is He looking to say? What is He looking to get done in His Word? What is He looking to accomplish? What's the desired effect of what He declares in His Word? So as preachers in the open air, as holding up the authority of God's Word, we are bound not only by what He says, but we're also bound by the intention of what God is looking to get done in every passage of Scripture and what effect is He looking to accomplish. And that's what it means to be faithful and to stay on the line. But let me ask you, because you obviously are preaching in the open air and some of you might have the opportunity to preach in a pulpit outside or inside. So let me ask you this question. What are your pressures? What's the tendency or what's your pressure to potentially go above the line and overstate or add to Scripture? When you have something inside your fellowship that you desire to address. Okay. I, I have one, if I could share this real quick. And this is a struggle I have, and actually one of the main reasons why I wanted to be a part of this. I have what is diagnosed as the opener preaching schizophrenia. I'm preaching, and maybe I have a thought, I'm reading a text or whatever, and whatever it is, I see a person or an object or something, and it distracts me, and I get distracted from the text, and I feel compelled to speak to that person or to that issue instead of sticking with the text. <laughs> okay. All right. We have a pressure for response. Yeah. Say that again, Bill. A pressure for response. We Bless see the pressure. Know. Oh, go ahead, Bill. Uh, we see the pressure to add to to gain a response from a crowd. Provoke. Provoke, yeah. Maybe sometimes your theological commitment. Oh, personal pride. There you go. Yeah, personal pride. Look what I know. See how smart I am. Historical and cultural background is is kind of huge for that too, Joe. Uh, look at how much I know about this passage in the background. And that overtakes it. Or the drive for social or political agendas. I'm going to preach about politics versus what the Word of God says. Or moralism. What God says, I'm going to use it to talk about politics. <laughs> right, right. So yeah, you can use the word as it preaches about leaders in politics, but let's not preach about the election or let's not preach about you know political figures. Let's stick to what the word of God says about politics. Yeah, now, I, think I know. I, oh, go ahead, Dan. I was going to say, I think of uh, theological preferences as being a, a huge one where we start inferring what a passage means because of our backgrounds. Yep. I know I'm getting ahead of the game a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and we'll have a whole section talking about that as well. <laughs> well, good. Those are some of the, the, I guess, the pressures to go above the line now let me get your thoughts. What are some of the pressures to drop below the line and kind of soften those edges or maybe say what God has not declared in his word? Oh, 
Yeah. Joe put in the chat, Jeff put in the chat, the fear of man. <laughs> to be liked by men. I think of you yourself not agreeing with what the text says, too. Uh, again, yeah. coming from a you know, liberal theological background. Yep. Uh, you avoid topics. You don't agree with it, so you just don't preach it. Or you cherry pick. I'm only going to find I'm only going to find scriptures that, you know, I can really drive home the sin to somebody. That's great, and that's true. Or we might uh, start preaching about God's love, that God is all loving to the exclusion of everything else. And we need to have that balance between the two as we're preaching. Otherwise, we run the risk of softening the edges of what God declared in his word. Well, if, if you're not living in yourself and you come to that realization when you're out there in front of people, you'll probably back off a little bit. Right. Right. So what are some other reasons? I mean, we talked about above and below the line, but what about straying off the line in general? I know the fear of man was a big one. Bias. Bias? <laughs> if that any of this makes sense, I was thinking of consistency. Yeah. We, uh, I was thinking we, are, we, we actually preach on the square. There's a universal church. And some days you can be so fervent, and other days you can be <laughs> And I don't know what happens to you. It's just moving to the the mood of what's happening. Right. Yeah. yeah, so consistency would be a reason for us to stray off the or inconsistency anyway to stray off the line. Ah, yeah, when you see somebody you know. All of a sudden you're preaching out in the open air and one of your friends comes by. And you're like, ooh. And you start to shy away from that. Um, yeah. And I know sometimes we don't think about some of these others, but think about this for a second. Is God's word and work sufficient? Do we have confidence that his word will do what he says it's going to do? And these are some these are some pressures. All of these are pressures of potentially going above the line, below the line, or even straying off the line. So what do we talk about? I mean, we're talking about staying on the line, holding fast, holding true to Scripture itself. Yeah. Yeah, sharper than anything. There you go. Um, Jeff saying sharper than anything that we can think of all on its own. Um, Dan, I, it's probably a piggyback there, but his word is alive and active. It is sharper than anything. Well, I think you have to believe that man understands what we're saying to a large degree. At least the Spirit of God can uh, convey it enough for them to have an understanding. As opposed to thinking right. that... Uh, what the Bible is saying is uh, completely uh, separated <clears throat> from the existence of a sinner. You know, everyone say that. Right. Yep. Yeah, we we. No, I, I think no, as Joe has said, we have to. Oh, go ahead, Mark. I was going to say anecdotally, the word being sharper, switched sword. Uh, I, I was. We had. A, we had. A, Josh and I both on the same. Uh, same. Same church, and the pastor was definitely sharp with the word. And I would, you know, he'd always, always leave his keys in his Bible, up, and I'd be cleaning up the sanctuary. And I come up and said, "Your sword, sir." <laughs> and yeah, as Bill said, we also have to uh, realize that uh, the people that were hearing us, um, you know, know what we're saying um, and believe what we're saying, um, and uh, even if they don't. 
You know, the power of the word is going to work. It's going to accomplish exactly what it is set out to accomplish, uh, whether to soften their heart or whether to harden their hearts. Uh, so let's take a look at some examples here as we work through um, a couple of examples of staying on the line. And then we'll go ahead and talk about what are some strategies, what are some guardrails to keep us um, from straying off that line. Uh, so tonight as we take a look at it, I want you to take about three minutes. And I want you to think about this, Genesis 3, 1 through 3. Genesis 3, 1 through 3. And as you look at this, did Eve go above the line or below the line? And did the serpent, as Satan, go above the line or below the line? So take three minutes. Read through Genesis 3, 1 to 3. And think about, did Eve go above the line? And did the serpent go above or below the line? So as you see this, Think about Eve and the serpent as Satan and uh, see if they went above the line or below the line. Three minutes. All right, let's come back together. Uh, yeah, I'm ready for an answer. As we take a look at Genesis 3, 1 through 3, either feel free to put it in the chat or unmute and share with us. First of all, Eve, uh, did she go above the line or below the line? All right, seeing in the chat, yeah, she went above the line. Uh, not only did she say that you shall not eat of the tree, but you shall also not touch it. Uh, so she added to what God exactly said in, um, based on chapter 2, verse 17. Um, and then some of you put for Satan as well, or for the serpent. 
Uh, the serpent went uh, below the line. Yeah. The serpent said, did God really say you shall eat of any tree? And of course, we know that um, he was specifically narrowing in on one tree, but also uh, questioning her uh, commitment to what God said in his word. Uh, so ultimately, uh, let me see in the chat here. Yeah, he changed and he reversed the language. Yeah, he kind of downplayed the sufficiency of God's word in doing that. So what did Eve gain? She gained protection. She gained religion is what she gained in it. By going above the line, she gained protection, but she also gained religion. And yeah, as Dan put, Satan implied intent. So he implied an intent in that case. And what did she lose? She lost the truth in what God said. And ultimately the provisions uh, that God provided in the garden. So Eve demonstrates how religion, rules and traditions replace that line. By going above the line, you're replacing that line. And by adding to what God has said in his word and uh, declaring what God has not declared, we basically are changing that line. And then the serpent represented how rebellion replaces that line by falling below the line, negating the truth of what God said in his word. All right, as you can see on the screen there as well, we're going to take a look at another example. And what I want you to do is I want you to go to, uh, I'll give you two minutes on this one. I'll give you two minutes and go to Romans 6, 7 and share with me how you think you could go above the line with this passage. So how could you say more with Romans 6, 7? All right, in the chat, uh, seeing how you could go above the line in this case, uh, common themes running through here, uh, free forever, uh, somebody put Pelagianism, uh, adding to the implication of being freed from sin, uh, freedom from sin comes through physical death, sinless perfectionism, yeah, I don't have any sin, I can be made perfect. So yeah, six, seven, if you wanted to in and of itself, you could make the case that I don't sin. I'm perfect. Uh, there is a chat and a comment, but I think I'm going to reserve that for a moment. I'm going to give you two more minutes. And now take a look several verses below, Romans 6.14, and think about how you could say less. So how could you go below the line and say less? than what the Word of God says in Romans 6.14, two minutes.
All right. I know we could probably work on an exposition of this all all night long, but just taking a look at uh, some of the comments that are in here, the moral law no longer applies. Yeah, as Sterling says, uh, the moral demands don't apply anymore. Um, others in the chat as well. Jeff, antinomianism would be the default less position. Uh, Dan uh, agreeing with uh, Bill Adams. The uh, I, I, When I see that that comment, it comes down to the first commandment of the Satanic Bible. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, do what thou wilt. I know uh, some of you are looking at it going, oh, that's really weird. But really from a, uh, you know, from a, a Christian standpoint, it's the same thing. I, I sin all I want. I'm under grace, man. Uh, I'm not under the moral demands of the law. I have no obligation. Uh, it's all about grace. Um, so you can see based on going above or below the line, just in one chapter, uh, can definitely change. And I know Jeff uh, put in there, context, context, context. And yes, context does determine meaning. And we're going to be taking a look at that in some upcoming sessions with a lot of examples, too, uh, to work through the different types of context there. Uh, so continuing to stay on the line, some examples here. I want us to take a look at um, a couple of minutes and I'm going to give you the scenario and if you don't know the verses uh, definitely give you some time to go back in those verses but we're going to look at these examples there's three of them and identify whether this scenario goes above the line or below the line and why and then how would we modify it so that we're on the line so here's our first example Romans 8:37 tells us that we are more than conquerors we're not just conquerors but we're more than conquerors. We have the power to confront any temptation and conquer it. Our prayers can conquer every fear and doubt. We can and we will conquer in our relationships, in our witness, and in our businesses. In all of our lives, we are more than conquerors. So I'll give you a couple of minutes, and based on that scenario, is this person going above the line? Are they going below the line or are they right on the line with this? All right. Yeah, as I'm seeing in the chat, this person who's using uh, Romans 837, we are more than conquerors, is going above the line. It is true that we are more than conquerors, but this person has actually used the more than conquerors and then launched preaching a gospel of success, prosperity, and constant victory. If you suffer then God doesn't love you, is basically what this person is saying. But none of this comes from the text. If you look in the previous verses, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? For it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long and regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. So, yeah, I, I'm with you. I don't see. <laughs> um, you're right. He is taking it out of context, or this person is taking it out of context, but they're kind of elevating. They're saying more than what God has actually said in his word. They're kind of making themselves super conquerors in anything. So any thoughts on how you could stay on the line with this verse? Yeah, Jeff's saying add more of the passage. <laughs> Look inside the context. 
Yeah, okay. Focus on what is said only. In death we are more than conquerors. Add through Christ. Yeah, reminding that we are in Christ. Yeah, there are many trials that we go through. There are difficulties we go through. And this shows that, yes, we can be more than conquerors, but it doesn't mean that somehow we conquer them and no longer have to face them. It says in all of these things, not in spite of these things. So continuing faithful obedience, continuing faithfulness, continuing to be faithful in light of the struggles is more glorifying to God than being taken out of the difficulty. And then yes, in Christ, a love of Christ, is what makes us more than conquerors. Not that we can become super conquerors in and of ourselves. In right, let's take a look at this one. Life that will be more than conquerors, like you said. So, right. like this guy is trying to say, if I just say, well, in Christ we're more than conquerors, that doesn't preclude what he uh, gave us in this verse, or in this example. You know, because somebody would say, well, in Christ we are conquerors in every aspect of our lives. Right. That's not the picture. The point is about suffering. Right. Right. It doesn't mean that, in, it doesn't mean in spite of these things, it means in them. In these trials, we're able to conquer. And yet, you have humanistic preaching, the centrality of the flesh. This is, human, this is humanistic preaching. This is moralism. You can do it, man. Be more than that super conqueror. Uh, Verses in the trial. Nothing can separate us from Christ's love in the trial because we'll be able to conquer it because of Christ. All right, let's take a look at another example. Jesus tells his disciples in Mark 10, verses 23 to 25, how difficult will it be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. While it is true that the wealthy people often feel little need for religious faith, the picture Jesus uses refers to a small gate in the city walls of Jerusalem called the needle gate, through which a camel could only pass if he first knelt down and all its baggage was removed, it's a picture parable of humility that wins salvation. Whether we are wealthy or not, we all need to come to God on our knees without all of our baggage. So, as you see this scenario, did this person go above the line or did they go below the line? And then, how could you look at this staying on the line. All right. Yeah, in this example, uh, as a couple of you have pointed out, 
going below the line. And I know uh, Bill had mentioned you've heard that before. Yeah. Uh, there's, it's a great illustration. It sounds really, really, really good. Uh, but the preacher sounds more credible, and they're going below the line because, number one, rich people do enter the kingdom of God. We see examples of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Solomon, Joseph of Arimathea, and others. And the text talks about a camel and a needle, not necessarily this gate. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a future session as to how that came about and what the danger of using uh, things like that are. Yeah, look at the big brain on the preacher. Uh, all, how, how much they come out of the historical context. But if you'll notice, a couple of verses later, the disciples didn't think about this needle gate. They asked the question, then who can be saved? And as Dan pointed out, this makes it seem like salvation is achievable. If you could only get down on your knees without your baggage and come to Christ, you can be saved. And the disciples are saying, well then if a camel can't go through a needle, and they're, they're, they're thinking of a needle itself, like a tent needle, or another sewing needle, they're like, that's impossible. And that's the point. Because Jesus is saying, salvation is impossible for you. And then he goes on in verse 27, with man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. The point's not about the needle gate. The point is, salvation is impossible in and of yourselves. But with God, Anything is possible. It's all God's work and none of us. So I know I'm running a, a little bit close on time here as well, uh, but uh, <laughs> as always, I'm like, I got way too much examples and way too much to go through in an hour. So I'm going to just jump right through this here. Um, and let's talk about some strategies here for staying on the line. What are these guardrails uh, that can keep us uh, from or keep us on the straight path and from veering off to the left and the right. Jeff, you pointed it out. Context, context, context. Uh, reading the verse in context is key, and it will help us stay on the line. Yeah, Joshua, you have the next one. Prayer. Pray for the Lord to give you wisdom. to help you stay on the line and to not deviate one way or another. Read with other people. Don't read the Bible in isolation. Read with other people. Community accountability. And yes, Sterling, you put it, it's not our message. <laughs> it's God's message that we should declare. But yeah, read with other people. Community accountability helps because your, your closest peers will be honest enough to tell you, I, I don't think you're reading that right. Have a systematic theology. An analogy of the faith. How do these doctrines line up with each other? And that will help keep you from straying off the line. Each would you say systematic theology would be the same as biblical theology? Um, close, but no. Um, actually, systematic theology is really taking the themes of the Bible like sin or angels or eternal security or eschatology or um, who God is, who man is, and taking all that the Bible says and putting them into these categories, kind of systematizing themes. Um, whereas but biblical theology is so, so um, not um, so, yeah, let's start over. Um, biblical theology is showing the grand theme or the grand narrative of how God is consistent 
in redeeming his people throughout scripture. Okay, just to back just to back up, so was the grand narrative you described that was that endemic to systematic or biblical theology? Biblical theology. Biblical, okay. All right. Biblical theology is seeing how themes, how um, how God works, how man never changes throughout Scripture, how God works throughout Scripture uh, from Genesis to Revelation, where systematic theology is taking themes of the Bible like sin, salvation, um, angels, the Holy Spirit, um, Christ, and saying all that the Bible has to say about one of those doctrines or theological themes. But proper time in the Word. Put in the hard work. As we work through the pathway to preparation, you want to work through it, you want to spend the time and carefully discern and understand what God is actually saying. And yes, in uh, <laughs> in one of the, the videos, uh, or actually in one of your uh, views, Dan's holding up uh, Wayne Grudem's systematic theology. Uh, there's several other theologies that systematic theologies out there. Uh, some of them have different theological uh, preferences, but uh, primarily uh, you'll get a good sense for a lot of them. Number six, the analogy of Scripture. Scripture never contradicts itself. And Scripture interprets Scripture. If you have one passage that seems like it is negating another one, there's probably another Scripture that's going to clarify it. So the analogy of Scripture, it's non-contradictory. Scripture interprets Scripture. Interpret the obscure passages in light of the more clear passages. Don't try to pull an obscure passage and run with that. Along those lines, biblical theology, as Dan pointed out, have a biblical theology. What's the best way to do that? Read the Bible consistently and completely. Know how God is working throughout all of his covenants and how Christ has instituted the new covenant. It doesn't free us from the moral demands, but it frees us from the demand itself, as in we can't keep the moral demand. Christ fulfilled that. But he, uh, he gives us the ability to work through the moral demands in him, not in and of ourselves. Uh, if you want some suggestions, Graham Goldsworthy, the Goldsworthy Trilogy, is a good biblical theology. Um, David Murray, Jesus on Every Page, is a good read for biblical theology. Uh, Vaughn Roberts, God's Big Picture, is a good one. And then I'm going to put an author in here um, his works about preaching Christ in the Old Testament as well as in certain books. Um, Sidney Greednos uh, has a series of preaching Christ in the Psalms and preaching Christ in Daniel and some of the other books, but also preaching Christ in the Old Testament. And he ties in uh, that biblical theology. Fear of being unique. If you're the only one who has ever seen anything in, in the Bible that no one else has seen, or maybe one other commentator has seen, um, I would be very cautious if you're, you're on the right track. <laughs> we, we, we learn from those that have gone before us, and if, if you and one other person are like, yeah, we got this down, this is exactly what it means, I would be wary of coming up with an interpretation that no one or very few have come up with. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So obviously in certain traditions, 
Uh, you know, if you start reading in one uh, tradition, shall we say, you're not going to read opinions from another tradition, which are valid. So you could theoretically, I'm not opposing what you're saying, I'm just providing a kind of the way I've seen it happen a couple of times. But anyway, so you come up with a new idea within your tradition because your your guys aren't reading other positions. See my point? And so yep, you could yeah. theoretically come in a position and then people challenge you, but it's a valid position. So right. what's well, your suggestion in that situation? Right. If it's a valid position, um, I would be very cautious of personally jumping out there and declaring this is absolutely what Scripture means in this sense. Um, yes, there are a lot of different theological positions that, that take on a passage, and we at least need to be aware of them. Uh, we at least need to let them challenge us on it. And coming up also with number nine, sometimes we, in, in humble submission, need to say, am I really seeing this right? Um, I'm not, I'm not going to rely on all of church history as a basis for it and a sole basis for it, but when we look throughout church history, and I know we have different doctrinal positions on certain aspects of theology, but when we look at it as a grand theme, if we have a, if we have a, I, I hate to use consensus by majority, but if you're like one of two people out there that has come up with this position, and you have the rest of everybody else saying, yeah, I don't see it. Um, that, that would want me to at least step back, uh, do a little bit more research uh, before I am confident that I am on the line and everybody else is wrong. Well, I'm, I'm also under the fearful of being unique. If, if you are unique, it is likely that you have somehow violated either systematic theology or biblical theology. There's a good possibility. <laughs> There's a good possibility. And along those lines, that's why I kind of tie nine in together, humility. You know, we, we need to have a, a humble heart when we come to Scripture that really none of us have gotten it right. Um, and, and that sounds really weird. You're like, Heath, you're teaching us tools and principles to try to get it right. But the only one who has the Word of God declared perfectly is God. Christ. And, and we need to... We need to humble ourselves enough to submit ourselves under the word and realize that we're all working through this um, and we all haven't arrived in this. Um, so we, we, we check scripture. We check our interpretation for staying on the line with um, other sources, with other brothers to make sure that we're staying on the line and be humble for correction um, because we're, we all have not arrived and interpreted scripture perfectly. Um, worldview is a guardrail. As a biblical worldview, we need to view everything through the lens biblically. Um, and that will keep us from those social, those political, those other types of um, opportunities to stray beyond the line, like the social justice issues or political issues or even some of the, the racial issues that are going on right now. As, uh, as it was mentioned previously, and we'll talk about this also in the future, theological framework. Be aware that all of us come to Scripture with a theological framework and that we need to be aware of it and not let that drive our interpretation. Know that you have it. Know that it, it can sometimes drive our thoughts on things. We get excited when we see election if we're from a theological persuasion. You know, we start jumping up and down going, see, there it is, there it is, there it is. And it may be. But let's make sure that it is truly there rather than what we're seeing through our own lens. A commitment to expositional preaching. This will keep us uh, from straying off the line. The Bible is in the driver's seat versus us. We sit below the Bible not above the Bible. 
<laughs> and then the whole counsel of God. We need to make sure that we have a balance of the Old and the New Testament together. So just some closing or some closing thoughts anyway as we move through these strategies. I'm going to keep them up here while you're uh, writing them down. The Word of God itself says it is inerrant and it is sufficient both for you and your hearers. I know we had mentioned that previously with some of the pressures um, and the dangers of falling off the line. Second Timothy 3:16 and 17. It is totally sufficient for the work of gospel ministry. And Paul, in his second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 4, verse 2, we have renounced shameful hidden things, not behaving with craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but with open proclamation of the truth, commending ourselves to every person's conscience before God. We need to use the tools that we're about ready to go through carefully and discern what God actually said in his word. As uh, Sterling said previously, it's not our message. We're ambassadors. We speak the message that we represent. We don't redefine the message. We don't change the message. We don't add to or take away the message. We speak the message that God has told us to speak. And know that we're not wiser than the Holy Spirit. We don't have the right to mess with God's word and declare what he has not spoken in his word or to not declare what he has spoken in his word. So we don't have the right to mess with his word. We don't have the right to speak where he hasn't spoken and not speak where he has spoken. And then one other topic, uh, as we take a look at working in the open air, be careful of topical preaching. Can you preach on sin alone? Can you preach on Christ alone? Can you preach on God alone? Yes. But the danger with it and to be faithful to it means you have to say everything the Bible has said about it in your 20-minute sermon in the open air. And with the multitude of scripture, it's hard for people to fact check you. To be held accountable to it um, if you're not taking the totality of that topic in, in line. And that's our danger as an open air preacher. We want to consolidate the whole counsel of God, Genesis to Revelation, exhaustively in our preaching. That's what we want to do throughout it. But you can do that with a text of scripture rather than trying to pull from all of these places to try to fit what we're trying to accomplish. So that's my, that's my, I guess you could say, commendment to you. It's my conviction that we need to stay on the line and we need to be like Balaam and speak no more than what God has spoken in his word. So I pray that as we continue on this journey, uh, you'll be with me in that conviction and you'll want to do the same. So I know we've run a little bit over on time. I apologize for that. Um, <laughs> thank you for sticking with me. Um, but uh, if you do have questions, I'll be willing to kind of stick by for a little bit and answer some questions. Jeff, you're very welcome. Sterling, thank you.
Josh, it looks like you're going uh, kind of techno on us there. <laughs> I, I think my uh, camera was trying to see if it was staying on the line or not, so I had to uh, <laughs> get, the, get the right time. There you go. Actually, uh, if you have time for a quick question, Heath, I do have one question. Yeah. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is, I'm going to try to summarize this as quick as I can. I don't know if you can answer this super quick, but okay. So okay. let's take let's take a biblical position, and someone is arguing from that position from a position of silence. Like let's take uh, infant baptism, for example. There's a There's a big one. Would you say that that is staying above the line or below the line? Ooh, I, I, I may, I, this is not how to win friends and influence people, Josh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> from, the, the thing I will tell you is this. If you are arguing from a doctrinal position, um, you need to be aware of that doctrinal position, um, and you need to be aware that that doctrinal position may be um, skewing the lens uh, from what you are actually interpreting that scripture. Um, so uh, again, in, in places where God has not spoken, uh, we should not definitively and declaratively speak for God. But where he has spoken, we need to speak definitively and declaratively. So I, I know that, that, that helped and it may not have helped. But, uh, you know, we, we just need to be aware that when we're trying to stay on the line, that our theological frameworks can have an effect on whether or not we are staying on the line. And we need to be aware of that. And we will uh, we'll venture into that a lot more as to uh, some guideposts to, to help us with that as well. And, and background is not always a hindrance to understanding. Sometimes backgrounds help us understand things like adoption better if we've been adopted or, or things like that. Right. But, but certainly when it comes to... Um, Theological stances of certain denominations, those can greatly influence how we interpret scripture. And we need to be aware that everybody has them. Nobody's immune yeah. from a theological framework. Even an atheist has right. got a theological framework. <laughs> yes, they do. He's got a point. Yes, they do. They have a worldview, and that's how they view their lens through. All right, sounds good. And uh, if there are no other questions, then uh, we will see you next week. And we're going to dive into context. Uh, so I hope you'll join me as we take a look at uh, how to understand God's Word rightly in light of context. Keith, are we gonna, is it in our schedule to talk about how worldview affects or impacts or even how our frameworks impact our, our understanding? That's, yes. that's coming up. Okay. Yep. Good night. Have a good evening.